To say you gotta know somebody Or know somebody To get somewhere these days To say you know that's alright Yeah, that's alright Cause you know that's alright with me Yeah, you know that's alright Yeah, that's alright Cause you know that's alright So, uh, without further ado I'm gonna bring up my friend Tom Farris From First Choice Bank uh, Tom and I have known each other uh, since high school. <laughs> Too long. Yeah. And uh, one thing I can tell you about this guy is he's a smart guy. He knows how to get deals done. So when you need a loan from a bank, you know, and these things can be tricky, you need somebody who can tell you the truth and who can help you get the loan. And these guys always get it done for me. And that's why I've been doing business with them for, for over 20 years now. And um, they got a whole filing cabinet over at their office with my name on it from all the deals that we've done together. But they, they've earned my business, they earned my respect. And tonight, Tom's going to share with you how we can all get more loans from banks. So, Tom Fabs. Thanks. Uh, you know, a lot of people look at a bank now and they think we're not giving out money. And it's so far from the truth. It's just we're not giving out money to people who just are breathing and have a job. <laughs> You know, now Phil talks about getting uh, houses without using any of your own money. That's great, it works for him. There is a time where a bank will become utilized in your careers as an investor though. You want to pull money out of a property. You can do it with hard money, but it's a higher interest rate. And if you're holding that property for a long term, you would rather be in a loan that's a 30 year fixed loan like you probably have on your own. You know, maybe a little higher interest rate because an investor loan is a higher interest rate. Bankability for investors. A lot of people don't realize that it's no different than when you're buying your own home. We're looking at your debt to income ratio. As investors, you tend to write off a lot on your properties. If you're looking at eventually getting bank loans, you want your taxes looked at. You want to know that you're not writing off too much. You can make $100,000 a year and have five properties, write $40,000 off those properties, now you're only making $60,000 a year. You know, Phil wanted me to teach you how to become more bankable. There's things you have to watch within your portfolio. There's things that you have to watch within your tax returns that affect a bank's view of you when you come for a loan as an investor. Um, how many have done Fannie Mae investment loans? You know, as an investor. Not in 10 years, but you've done them. <laughs> and it's changed from 10 years. <laughs> Not a lot of people think the banks are pretty tight. Have you done one recently? No, I'm working on it right now. Huh? I'm working on it right now. You're working on it right now? How are you finding the process? Pretty hard. What's hard about it? Not a lot of paperwork and it's going back and forth. It's been like almost a month. You got a problem with your loan officer. <laughs> I don't mean that as a slight, not, I don't mean that because I'm a loan officer. There is a way to do a loan properly. And if you're a smart investor, you'll keep a portfolio ready for the bank. You'll keep, if you still have a job, you'll keep a folder with your pay stops. You'll keep, you know, you'll keep a file with your pay stops. You'll keep your tax returns together. You'll keep your bank statements together. You know, in a folder. You'll keep all this in one spot to make it less stressful for you. Let's face it, time's money. You don't want to waste time. Two months? Really? I've done loans in 15 days for investors. That's a long time. They're either stringing you along or something's wrong. That's the only thing I can say. If you ever want me to take a look at it, I'll be glad to. But when you're doing a loan with a bank, you're basically looking at your debt to income ratio, okay? What does that mean? We take your gross income, and we take the debts from your credit report, and we divide it into your income. Then we also take the new acquisition and divide that into the income with it. And that can't be over 45% of your gross income for an investor. Now, investors are required to put a larger down payment down. Typically on a single family house, you can put 15% down and get a Fannie Mae loan. A lot of people think you have to put 20 and 30% down. That's not true. On a duplex, you have to put 25% down. Now that money has to be sourced, so you're not allowed to borrow and take a personal loan 
to buy a property. You know, you can't go out, but you can take equity from another property to buy a property. Everybody following? So when you're looking at getting into the bank world, there's basically really one rule. Everything is common sense lending today. Now, with hard money, what do you guys look at? Something that comes into play, um, the assets first and foremost. And, and then everything you're saying is kind of in play with you're looking at how you present yourself, who am I dealing with. I'm dropping my numbers based on something that's not already it's a lot more uh, field-based. A lot more by field. Yeah, yeah. With us, it's hard facts. Hard, cold, common sense facts. So if you are coached properly as an investor to meet with a bank, and what I mean is, you want to sit with a loan officer prior to even thinking about buying, to be honest with you. Don't go out and look at the property first. Sit down with a loan officer, go through all the paperwork first. You wouldn't be sitting in your two month dilemma. I don't know if you sat with them before you went to buy. Are you buying or refinancing? I have a client to buy a client. Okay, did they tell you why? No, we don't have to share your personal information, but. If you sit with a loan officer up front, he's going to go through and maybe even coach you on how to do next year's tax return. I've done that for a lot of investors who may have written off too much to your prior. So you want to sit down and you want to go through, let's break it down. First, if you have a job, obviously if it's W-2 income, that's simple enough. We look at your gross pay. Okay? Now, if you work a job where you have expenses. Uh, some people write off their work clothes, some people write off their travel time, some people write off you know, their, their mileage. All those write-offs come off of your bottom line income. So again, if you're making $50,000 a year and you're writing $10,000 off on your you know, job expenses that your company doesn't reimburse, you've just lowered grid. You got maybe an extra 500 from the federal government from your taxes. You have an extra 500 from them, but you just stopped yourself from being able to buy an investment property. What's more important? Is everybody catching what I'm saying? If you write off too much of your income, you will not have the ability to buy the investment property. So it's either pay Uncle Sam or pay yourself. I would prefer to pay myself. Now, Phil's beyond this world because of the way he does things. And you may find yourself to that point as well. But even the bills come to me at times and say, hey, Tom, can I take money out of this property? Yeah, I wouldn't say I'm beyond it. I no, mean, that's, what I, that's what I mean. We're just, are you, we're part of the utility belt. Sure, sure. We're just a piece in the pie. As an investor, you need hard money lenders, especially if you're doing flips. Because personally, banks don't like flips. Because if you pay that loan off in three months, we just wasted a whole lot of time and a whole lot of money for nothing. But then we need you. Huh? I said, then we need you, though, usually a lot of property. And I was just going to say that. On the opposite side, if you start out with a hard money lender and decide to keep the property, well, his interest rates tend to be a little higher because it's hard money. And if you're going to keep the property, you want to get into a 30-year fixed, you know, straight out loan, I'll be taking his loan out. And that frees up money so he can lend it again. Right. And I do a lot of that in the city of Philadelphia. A lot of the new construction in Northern Liberties area is all built for investors. And these guys are putting their money down as well. I've, I've explained the whole concept to Phil. And they're building brand new properties. They're not rehabbing properties. They're building brand new properties. And what they're doing is they're promising the equity on their homes as the down payment on these properties. But at the end of the day, they come to me to take out the construction loans. Someone like that. So to get back to the debt situation, that's where you've got to start when you're starting with a bank. You gotta find out where that is, what you can afford to buy with what you're making now. Okay. Second, if the property happens to be rented when you're buying the property, they have dropped the rule. There used to be a rule. If you didn't have two years landlord experience, you could not count rents towards that property. You know, like if that property was rented, say nine hundred dollars nine hundred dollars a month, we count seventy five percent of that nine hundred into your debt to income ratio. Well, if the mortgage is only, say, a hundred and fifty thousand dollar property, the mortgage is only, you know, with taxes and insurance, you know, eight nine hundred dollars. Well, that's less income you need to buy that property if it's already rented. Does 
that all make sense? Okay, so if your debt to income ratio is straight, next is the down payment line. I always tell investors, if they can keep a bank account clean, and this, this is vitally important because a lot of investors move money around, and I'm sure you, you guys do it too between your accounts. Sure. Creates an issue for a bank. If you want to be more bankable, try to keep a clean bank account that you're stashing your investment money in. You know, a piece of your paycheck. You know, if you can keep a clean bank account that you're going to use for your down payment, you don't want money funneling in and out of it. It's going to make your life a lot easier if you're funneling, if you've got that account just for your investment property, just for your purchases, and money's going in to buy the properties. When we start seeing, and especially if you are one of those people who live paycheck to paycheck at times and maybe do an overdraft, that's a big no no. And we do see that. I just had a woman, I, I swear to God, she had $240 in bank fees a month in overdrafts for three months straight. That's right in and around there. That's financial mismanagement. We can't even, if she could be a perfect borrower, that bank account just killed that loan. Really? Oh yeah. She could have a great credit score, she could have all the money in the world, maybe in another account, but because, again, she had co well actually she did have a clean account, but those accounts were co because she transferred money from one account to the other and back into that account, so now we have to show both accounts. Oh, so you want to make so you know what I'm saying? So if I have an account that's separate, this is important. This is really important because this screws a lot of people up when it comes to, and a lot of people don't think of this. I don't even know if you think of this, but a lot of people get screwed up with bank accounts. If you can keep an investor bank account separate and funnel money into it from your paycheck, wherever, just remember the deposits that go into that bank account, I'd say about two months before you're ready to buy, cut off, stop putting money in, leave it set. Because then it's clean. It goes right through the bank. So how many months of bank statements do you require? Two. 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 So if I know I'm going to buy a house in 90 days, all I have to do is, is open up a, a bank account and, and just funnel investment money into it, keep it nice and clean and simple, and don't have any overdrafts. <laughs> and it's done. It's clean. It's, you're going through all the writing like that. Really? There'll be no questions. Because it's there's no... Funny business going on yourself. <laughs> There's no transfers in, transfers out. I just had to. Okay. Would you have to close out those other accounts? No, no. Since you're looking at both accounts, you said. Well, no. When we're looking at both accounts, we just want to know all the money that's going in. I don't care where it goes out, but all the money that's going in. What we're looking for when we're looking at bank accounts, we're making sure you're not borrowing money to buy the house. You're not taking credit card uh, advances. You're not taking personal loans. It is illegal. It's actually illegal. It's, you can't do it. It's just, it can't be done. In other words, if you go to the bank and say, get a $10,000 personal loan, put that money in the account, then come to me for a mortgage, and I see a $10,000 deposit, I'm going to say, where's this $10,000? Where did it come from? When you tell me it's from a loan, that money cannot be used to buy a house. So if I did three months ago, <laughs> Yeah, I wouldn't say that either. <laughs> <laughs> I would never allow any of my clients to do that. <laughs> There's things I'm not allowed to say. <laughs> but yeah, we, we source for two months. And yes, it's two months. But isn't that what a HELOC is, though? Ah, but what's a HELOC against? Passive. Your home. It's your money. You own that property. 401k loan. You're borrowing mm -hmm. money that is yours anyway. You're saying Unsecured money is what I'm worried about. Secured money, like I said, 401k or a uh, HELOC, all of that is good to go. You can use that. So if you're sitting on a property, you have $100,000 equity, you need $40,000, you get a $40,000 HELOC loan from the bank, which if anybody's unfamiliar with the term HELOC, it's a second loan. It's kind of like a credit card against your, uh, against your property where you only pay the payments on what you withdraw. But if you have that situation, that's a great way to buy property. Is because that's your money. You can use it because it's against something that you want. But it's also variable rates. Yes. You'd be better yes. off with a home equity loan 
which would be a fixed rate or a set rate. Um, that's a heel, right? All right. You guys want to get in real estate investing. Real estate investing does carry some risk to it. I would say the prime interest rate right now, when it goes up, and it's going to go up soon. They're going to raise it. They're going to raise it 0.25. Guys, he lot money still the best around interest rate wise. I would say for the next at least five years, it's still not going to be an issue unless the economy really picks up and we have it. I mean, the economy's really got to get really good for the HELOC rates to rise by much. It really does. I mean, they have not raised prime in. But if you were taking a home equity loan for 20 years, that puts it far, you know, far out into the future that you're at the lowest rates now. You'd be well, better off paying that extra half or 75, maybe even up a point more. If you plan on just keeping that HELOC and only paying that HELOC off for the 20 years, if you plan on becoming a seasoned investor, you're going to learn to roll over that HELOC over and over again. <coughs> you're going to learn to buy properties at a good price that you can then refinance to pay the HELOC back. So you find something that uh, needs work. That's turning it over properties. No, no, well. even for keepers. Uh, okay, I'm going to give you an example. I bought a property for cash, $18,000, cash, off my HELOC, okay? I took a $95,000 loan against that property, put $45,000 into it, paid my HELOC off, pocketed the rest tax-free, and the renters are paying the mortgage. Those are the kind of situations you want to look for when you're using your HELOC. You see what I'm saying? You want to look... So these sort of things Phil's going to teach you. You want to look to take advantage of the money that you can. If it be the private money that he uses, the hard money that he could have offer, the bank's money. These are all tools. These are all tools that you have in your utility belt when you're out investing. So there's ways to make a HELOC work to your advantage. Would I recommend getting a HELOC and planning on paying it for the next 20 years? Probably not. I would want to find a way to pay it off faster. And how do you do that? You buy smart, you find a property, you can pull the money back off to pay, pay the HELOC off, and then use the HELOC again to buy another property. <laughs> and you just keep rolling it that way. And that's yeah. the way to functionally use a bank to buy properties, if you have a property that you can borrow against. In the good old 90s, that's how I build up my portfolio. I'd use my HELOC to buy a house with cash, and I would fix it up with the HELOC money, and I would stick a good tenant in there, and then I'd go to Tom and say, give me a loan. He'd, re he'd refi through his bank, give me the loan, I'd pay off my HELOC, and I'd do it again. And every three months, it just kept buying another house, another house, another house. Yes? What's the criteria as far as differences go? Uh, refinancing, refinancing a property that's, that you have free clear versus buying a property that you don't own. Sorry, I think I'm sending you. You have a property for in clear. Right, and you just want to put a refi. Pull the money out. Do you use the play? Yeah. Do you use the start investing to go move? No, I mean, what I'm saying is, if I was to come to you and say, hey, here's, I have two things I want to do. Uh, one is I want to pull the money out of a property that's green clear. The other one is I don't own the property, and I don't know, there's a bunch of ways to put down payment and then take out. A loan for the balance. What is required? What's the difference as far as what? Am I, if I'm understanding your your question correctly, you're saying I have a property free and clear. I want to buy this other property. Would it be better to refinance my home for like a 30 year mortgage and pull the money out, or would it be better to put a HELOC against it? Is that what you're asking? Uh, you can do it that way too, I guess. All right. I would recommend the HELOC every time in a scenario like that only because in a HELOC you only pay on what you borrow. Say you want $100,000 as the money you want to play with to be able to buy more properties. If you take $100,000 in a 30 year fixed mortgage, that mortgage payment is going to be the same through the whole life of the loan. If you do it through a HELOC, you may only need $30,000 of it to buy the house. Now your mortgage payment is only on the $30,000 that you borrow and you've got all that extra money just still sitting there that you can borrow at another time. It's usually a five-year period that HELOCs last for. Some banks will extend them, but it's usually a five-year period where you have the open window to borrow against it. After the five years, you may have to have the HELOC redone with the bank to get another five years. What I'm asking for is, 
what do you require of the borrower? It the oh, same? it's the same. Yeah, it's the same thing. Okay. We're looking at debt to income ratio. We're looking at, obviously, you know, your credit score, which I haven't touched on yet, which I will a little bit. But we're just looking at the same information as you would with any loan. Okay. Uh, HELOCs are, are based on something. Whether prime. it's a prime rate. They're usually prime. Um, it might be LIBOR, it could be, could be. Uh, Wall Street Journal, I can come up for us. Um, are there any significant differences in there that it's worth asking the bank what it's based on? It's a good question, actually. I never thought of it that way. Um, the only HELOX I've ever had is Prime. And as a loan officer, I do not write HELOX myself because it's just something that we need to the bank side. Where I, I do the first mortgages more or less. But I have found that no matter what you're using as your index, whether you're using LIBOR or you're using Prime, the interest rates seem to follow each other. There's not one that seems to outperform the other, if that's what you're asking. It, it just doesn't seem, well, think about it. If one outperformed the other, one would eventually disappear. And no one would want to use it, it wouldn't be offered anymore. In shopping for a HELOC, what other questions would you be asking them? You want to know the, the term that you can borrow for. Like I said, a lot of them do it for five years, where you have a five-year window where you can utilize the money in the HELOC, and then they stop your ability to pull from it. Okay? And of course, you want to know when it's going to adjust, how fast it's going to adjust. It usually adjusts once a year. Some of them I have seen adjust monthly, though. I have seen, I have seen you know, things of that nature. Um, and really, one thing the banks have done in the last five years is we're all vanilla. There isn't a whole lot of spice in the bank world. Whereas back before the market crash, there was all kinds of loan programs out there. They're gone. I mean, it's all common sense lending now. It's all going to, like I started out, if you had a job and you were breathing, you could get a mortgage in 06 and 07. You need to get a job. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's right. You had to be able to follow <laughs> right. I remember. You know what? And what's crazy about it is we were allowing people who were W-2 income go stated. Think about that. Mm -hmm. We were allowed someone who made $50,000 a year tell us he made sixty five, and we didn't question it. <laughs> or a janitor making seventy five. I think one or two of those people were dead, too. <laughs> The go bar was dead, but he still had money coming in. <laughs> it's true. It was that it did get to a ridiculous point when you look at it. Today, it's common sense. Can you afford to pay the monthly payment, either on your own or through the renters? I had a question for both you and Bill. You said you paid it off in like a few like three or four months. Is that right? No. Back in the back in the '90s, when I was just learning this business, I had a house and I had like I think it was a sixty thousand dollar line of credit against one of the first pieces of real estate that I bought. So I would use that money at the time I was buying in Mayfair. I could buy houses in Mayfair for like thirty grand back then, and I buy a house for thirty grand, then I fix it up, <clears throat> whatever that cost, ten grand, fifteen grand, whatever it was, and. Uh, <clears throat> So I'm using my cash out of the HELOC. I'm not borrowing off of anybody but me. And once I get a tenant in there, and now the tenant's paying rent, I would go to Tom. Different world, because it was back in the mid-90s. I'd go to Tom and I'd go, let's get this, this house that, that I just bought for 30 grand, and we'd go get it appraised. Because now it's worth more because it was fixed up, so it was worth more than what I paid for it. Plus it had a tenant in it, and and it was earning a rent roll, and I had a lease, and I could prove that to him. Maybe he could get the building appraised for 52. And then his bank was willing to lend me, back then, 90% of 52, so he's giving me back, you know, $45,000, and I got back the bulk of the money that I put in it. So maybe it wasn't a no money down deal, but it might have been only four or five grand I had into the house. And when the tenant moved in, at $1,000 a month, the tenant gave me first months and last, so I got 3000 bucks off the tenant. So what was I out? Maybe two grand? So it was like almost like a free house. And then I turn around and he'd pay off my, he'd give me the loan, I'd pay off my credit, he locked, 
Turn around and do it exact again. How long of a period of time? Three months, easy. Three months, it's I describe this, what I used to call the, I call it the all money down technique. And if you get a copy of my book, you can read about it in detail, how I did this. And I did it constantly. Four or five, six houses a year. People we are just, still doing it today. Yeah. yeah. Are yeah, they? Tell us how they're doing it today. How are they the doing same it? The, the same way? The same way. I just recently did it myself. Um, when I started out, I took a $90,000 line of equity against my house. I bought a house for $12,000. I put $28,000 into it, sold it for sixty-five, dollars paid my HELOC back. Yeah, and he's talking about borrowing money. I, I, knew, I knew you could have been borrowing money because you need one year season. Huh? You, He's talking about borrowing money to keep the house. You're sold. No, out. no, no. I saw no, but I was just getting into it. No, you need six months season, not a year. You only need six months season, okay, to refinance. Explain what that means. Okay. All right. When you buy a house, say you buy a house all cash, and you want to put a mortgage on it, okay. To take cash out, you need to own that property for six months. That's the rule. That's different from the HELOC where you said two, three months. Correct. Correct. Okay, but but just because it's six months now, maybe that will change in the future. Actually, it could because it was 12 months. Right. It was last 12. Year. They dropped it to six. Yeah. Last I didn't year even it know was they 12. Because yeah, right. that's why you were saying 12. It was yeah, 12. Exactly what I said. Yeah. And, what, and what that means if you bought the house for 100000 and the house is worth a million, it's only worth 100000 to the bank for six months. No matter what it's worth, the bank will only appraise it at 100000 for six months. After, after six months and one day, it's worth whatever it's worth. Now, I, I don't want to get too far technical with you, but there is a way to pull money out that you personally put into the property prior to six months, but you can't get it all back. You can get up to 80% of it back. If you can show what you bought it for, what you put into it, you know, acquisition, mm -hmm. construction, you know. You do. Yeah. If you, can show, if you can show your acquisition costs and your construction costs, you can pull a percentage out of that prior to six months. You know, but your loan to value, and what loan to value means, you guys heard that 20% down, well that's 80% loan to value, 10% down is 90% loan to value. Your loan to value is based off of acquisition and construction and not what the property is worth prior to six months. Well, Spargo is doing that. I'm sorry? Well, Spargo has been doing that for a few years. Everybody does. What, what, one thing you got to realize is all the banks follow the same rules, but some banks have overlays. And what an overlay means is we all follow Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Does everybody know who they are and what they do? Everybody hears how they run the economy, but that isn't what the banks use them for. What, you know when you see a bolt and nut, they're American standard, so a three-quarter bolt will fit into a three-quarter nut and they will be able to tighten on? Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac write the rules for mortgages that are sellable out in the marketplace. So all the banks that write loans that can be sold underwrite to a Fannie Mae and a Freddie Mac guideline. I feel like I'm getting a little too technical, but... So when we're following the rules for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, Wells may say, you know what, I don't want to have a loan for six months. And they have the right to do that. But Fannie may say it's okay, so my bank may be able to do it. So when the banks have different overlays, and like for some banks like Bank of America right now, it's very tough on some, some, some things that, you know, SunTrust isn't. And what's beautiful about my bank is we, we are a bank, in fact, we have three branches out here in the counties um, that we just opened up within the last year, First Choice Bank. One's in Warminster, one's in uh, uh, Yardley, and uh, I forget where the third one is now. I haven't driven by it yet. <laughs> but uh, we're spreading out into the counties now, First Choice Bank is. We, we do keep some of our loans, but we sell it out into the marketplace as well. So all our loans are Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, but we underwrite to Fannie Guides. We have no overlays. Do you look for uh, investors that are can you do a HELOC for investment property? I don't write HELOCs, but yes, I can get you a HELOC for investment property. You can get HELOCs for investment properties. The interest rate's usually higher by a point to a point three quarters, but yes, you can get HELOCs on investment properties. 
Um, I can also do construction loans on investment properties. This is real neat. If you find a property that's $100,000, you can put 20% down on that $100,000 if you need 80 grand to fix it up and say it's worth you know, 240, 250 at the end of the day. I can get you the $80,000 to fix that property up. So you don't have to put it all out of your pocket. At what cost? Huh? At what cost? Regular Fannie Mae loan. Regular Fannie Mae construction loan. We call it construction to burn loan. And we will base the value of the home off of what the house will be worth when it's fixed up. You're talking about 203B? No, 203K is what you're thinking. That's only FHA. The FHA does not do investment properties. But there is a conventional product that allows you to do construction. Now, the only stipulation is the construction has to be done by a licensed contractor. And if you are a licensed contractor, you still can't do the work. It has to be done by somebody else. <laughs> yes. So that's the only downside for anybody. I've heard a couple of people say they want to work on their own properties, maybe fix up their own properties. In a Fannie Mae loan, you cannot do it yourself. You won't? No. Now, if you have a friend who's a contractor and you work together with him and he gets the money and pays you, that's fine because we don't know about it. But technically, you can't work on the properties yourself. Before starting the construction, you give the loan off. Well, what you do in a situation like that, I feel like we're going all over the book here, but that's fine. It's a okay. free flow meeting. When you're doing something like that, you go into the house, you get your contractor to go in the house and bid the work out as you would any job. And of course, pad it a little bit to make sure for some unforeseen, like you open a wall up and all of a sudden you're like, oh my God. Like that house in Warminster you bought with the wall that was totally eaten away. I don't want to talk about that. I, <laughs> <laughs> I just remember that. It always comes to my mind when I say this in other seminars. Is that not, I'm sorry, Phil, to bring up the thing, but that one just comes to mind. But anyway, you just have them bid, maybe have three guys bid the job. Pick who you're going to do, it, and then we approve the contractor. Obviously, the contractor has documents that he has to sign for me. You know, he's got to be licensed, he's got to be insured. Um, and we will, on a single family home, lend up to 85% of the home's value. But, well, everybody knows what PMI is, right? No. I'm sorry, yeah. PMI is when you don't put 20% down in your home, you pay for an insurance policy. I guess you're in default, basically. You're covering the bank's losses in case you go into default when you don't have 20% down. Okay? So, yes, you can do a Fannie Mae loan. We will lend you the money. Now, where's the advantage to that? Let's say you got, say you got the $80,000 equity line. You can tie it all off to one property, or you can do two. If you got that much gumption that you want to do two, and you can, you're bankable for two, you can do two with the money you would have spent on one. Make sense? You know, the object is to use as little money as possible to gain as much property as possible. These guys, they've gone well beyond my comprehension on some of the things they've done. But, because I'm in the bank world, so, to me, sometimes it's like, I still don't believe some of it, but he doesn't. And I've seen him do it. I can't tell you how many times. I don't know why I'm not doing it myself. How many mortgages you can have? Like, that, that's Great question. Cool. Ten. Ten financed mortgages, and you are cut off from the banking world. Yeah, but that's not such actually an improvement. It wasn't that long ago. It was four. It was four. Yeah. Tens. It's pretty good. Work with so that's that. from your bank? Or oh, no. Collective? No, that's aggregate 10 water. mortgages. Aggregate. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, 10 mortgage properties. Now, if you have two loans on one property, that only counts as one. So if you have a HELOC and a primary mortgage on your family home, and you know you have eight other properties that you have mortgages on, you're still only at nine. You can do one more. Is that 10 um, property loan account and the bank keeps it on the books? Or is that only a thing that's on All right. If a bank portfolios, they can go over 10. I actually have a product in my bank that I go over 10. But that's for a jumbo. It's just a different world. That's for anything over 4 and 17,000. I do a special jumbo product for my clients that are building downtown Philly right now. 
that they have 20 properties, I don't care. Okay, so there are banks who will go over the 10 limit, but it's portfolio. What I mean by portfolio, it is the bank is holding onto the paper, they will never sell it, it will never see, it will never be transferred to another bank, it's portfolio, it's in the bank, they can do what they want. A lot of banks chose not to do those mortgages anymore because the federal government has made them put so much money aside for every one of those loans. They have reserve requirements. So when bank holds on to paper, they have reserve requirements that the federal government requires them to keep. It limits their lending ability, in other words. Make sense? Clarification. The limit is 10 properties where the banks hold the paper, or it doesn't matter where they hold 10 mortgage properties. Mm -hmm. If you own 10 properties that have mortgages on them, you're at your limit. It doesn't matter who has the mortgage. 10 mortgage properties that are reported at the county courthouse. Then you gotta come to my world for a number Oh, of then you're in his world, totally. Yeah, <laughs> 10 <laughs> mortgage properties. That means 10 <laughs> notes are recorded on those properties. What about blankets? <laughs> blankets are still covering three different properties, so it's considered... Three homes? Three homes. Remember, it's mortgage yeah. property. The rule's mortgage property. Do you have access to non recourse I don't. But 10 mortgage properties, remember, mortgage properties, it's, if the property has a mortgage on it, it counts as one. Two properties, have, two properties on the same mortgage as a blanket, it's two mortgage properties. Mm -hmm. Both pro properties have mortgages attached to it. You mean so, when you reach 10, that's it for life? Oh no, that's it for the family. Sell world. one and then. Oh yeah, you yeah. sell one. Yeah, you go back, back under ten. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you go back under ten. You can get another one. Okay. Yeah, I got you. Now, if you had ten investment properties, you could buy a primary home and have an eleventh mortgage. Okay, because they do allow that. You know, or say your house is paid off and you have ten investment properties, you can get a loan on your house and pull money out of your house, believe it or not, because the primary mortgage doesn't count in that. Okay. Also, uh, the commercial lending world. Some people will even bundle up some of their homes and put commercial paper on it. Those papers, no, that, those mortgages no longer count as mortgages when it's a commercial loan. You just freed up a few more properties to go to Fannie Mae. The only advantage to Fannie Mae mortgages is the interest rate and the 30, 30 year fixed term. It's smart for some of your keep and hold properties. For money, you know, you're done playing with the money in this house. Let's put a loan on it and we're moving on to other better, bigger, and better things. Like I said, it's a tool in your TV utility belt. You'll never get rich with Fannie Mae mortgages in the investment world. You use it as a tool. And the tool does come in handy, like Phil said. It's just a tool. It's a tool to maybe grab money for a down payment on a bigger project. But it is a tool. <coughs> does that all make sense, guys? Yes, sir. You better provide investment property. You got the LLC or a personal? <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's a great question. You might as well throw trust in there too. Mm -hmm. um, actually, no. <laughs> I can do a trust mortgage in Fannie Mae Roll. In fact, I, oh yeah. In fact, are you sitting on my Knox? I brought the rules only because a lot of fills. A lot of Phil's um, seminars and things that I see when I get his uh, emails and stuff, they talk about trust law. <laughs> so what I've done, and, and you guys can all take a copy of this, this is the trust world. In fact, what you'll see down here is th these are just banks we do sell mortgages to, in my bank, to some of them. It'll say who will take what kind of you know, trust, like primary, two to four unit, and things of that nature. You know, don't go by that. That isn't. I'm not telling you to go to those banks. I'm just telling you that's one of my. That's the overlays I was talking about earlier. Some banks won't allow a trust. For example, Stonegate Mortgage. I don't know about most. All right, Chase won't allow one to four unit. A one to four unit investment property. Chase will not allow a trust mortgage to be clo uh, a mortgage to be closed in a trust name. Hmm? Well, it's just one of the lenders I sell loans to. And, and that's why that, that little grid is down there. That's not for you. What I have attached here is the type of trust, for example, uh, must be revocable, 
And also, I've also attached a lawyer's opinion letter format. So if you do establish a trust, you get your lawyer to write the opinion letter on this type of format, and that trust will be Fannie Mae approved. LLCs are not Fannie Mae approved. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac will not allow an LLC mortgage in to close with their guidelines. Once you're in LLC world, you are in commercial lending totally. Make sense, guys? And these are all here for your take. You, you, you could you could buy something in a trust and have your LLC be the beneficiary. You could still absolutely. You could still help that way. Actually, that helps me with taxes, but you wouldn't believe when we were talking about debt to income ratio. There are ways to play your tax return properly and have LLCs responsible for a lot of what goes on in your investment properties. But when your K one comes. I don't want to try to make yourself break even. You can lose a little bit. How's this? For tax purposes, does everybody know what depreciation is? Anybody not know what depreciation is? Explain it. Well, I was going to, but I <laughs> show of hands. When you buy a property every year, you can depreciate it by a percentage. What that means is you're telling the government, I bought it for 100000 this year. Next year, worth 97. I depreciated it by $3,000. And you can depreciate on down for a for, for year, for what, 10 years? It's uh, one, 127. Is it 127? Yeah. It breaks down about 10 years. You get 127. It breaks down to be about 10 years? No. As it drops? No. 27 and a half. 27 and a half years. Okay. But anyway, as you depreciate the property, that depreciation in my book is income. So if you depreciated a property by $3,000 on your tax return, that's $3,000 to the good for me. That's income for me. You're counting that in underwriting? That in underwriting, that is income. Absolutely, it's income. That is income to me. For the federal government, for you, it's a deficit. It's an expenditure. So you get to write that off. So Correct. I was just going to say that. But when you sell it, you will pay taxes on that depreciation. Hmm. But after the gobs of money you yes. made on that good deal. Again, another another wonderful reason to own a big portfolio. <laughs> okay? Show almost no income, so I don't have to give the feds any money. But I got a, a truckload of depreciation, which he can use to give me a loan. So you're going to pay taxes eventually anyway? One way or another, you're going to pay taxes. I mean, it's just inevitable. You're going to sell a property and pay taxes. It's going to happen. Yeah, sure. There are two exceptions. If the property is owned in a Roth IRA, and if you do a 1031 exchange. Well, a 1031 exchange, you've got to roll into another property. You have to roll it into something. Yeah. yeah. But I'm it's saying, yeah, but and 1031 exchanges do work. They do. Terrific. You know, they're fantastic. Explain the Roth IRA property roller, if you could. Well, I'm not a financial advisor. <laughs> to be honest with you, if one of you guys were from the Fed and I started talking about Roth IRAs, I can get my wings clipped. <laughs> <laughs> what's, your, what's your question? <laughs> I just wanted him to explain a little bit more. I guess the equity of the house just goes right in your Roth after you want to roll it over. Is that how it works for that? No, the Roth owns the house. Most real, estate, most real estate investors use a self-directed IRA. Okay, you move your money to uh, an IRA custodian that is um, already set up to allow you to invest in other things by yourself, such as real estate or gold or whatever you want to buy. And you, you buy your trust, I mean your uh, your uh, IRA basically buys the house, and any profit that comes from that just goes back into the IRA, and it's all tax free. Right. Okay. right, that's basically what most real estate investors do. Lots of private lenders do it too. Uh, a lot of the private lenders that lend money to us have money in their IRA. The IRA lends money to us, we own the house, they own the note, and I don't make payments to the private lender, I make payments to the private lender's IRA. Self directed IRA. Great asset protection. 
But yeah. you lose depreciation. Well, but there's always going to be a trade-off. There's always a trade-off. There's always a trade-off. And nothing's ever 100% of your game. And, uh, you know, through all the talks here, when he talks about being a deal engineer, that's one thing you're going to learn as you come here is there are going to be certain properties that should be done certain ways. And there's going to be other properties that should be done other ways. It's the truth. Not every property should be done with a Fannie Mae mortgage. Not every property should be done with hard money. Not every property will be a construction loan. Will you use your HELOC here, or would you use it in another place to more benefit you? Right? So, you know, real estate really is like a fingerprint. And that's probably why you love it so much, because you've got ADHD and you can't concentrate on something long enough. And, and, and it really is like a fingerprint. I mean, the deals are all so different. And even every mortgage I write, they're never the same. You know, it's just everybody's different. All their assets and their incomes and everything's so much different. There's a lot of different things that go into real estate. Like I said, you need all the tools. You need